Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. This is episode 58. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Souza Ma, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Good day to you, Dr. Woolman. And a great day to you, Christina. How are you? <laughs> Fantastic. You traveling monster, you. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your medical guide today, along with Christina, as we travel through the healthcare galaxy, searching for ways towards optimal health. Today, I'm very happy to announce that we are going to be interviewing Dr. Kathy Groover. Uh, she's an author and national speaker on natural healings. She's an educator. She has her own television show. Uh, and many more things that we will get into, and that's why we're going to spend the hour with her. But before we do, Christina, how do we get in touch in case people want to ask Dr. Kathy some questions? Thank you, Glenn. Um, at any time during this live presentation, you can feel free to ask a question or make a comment by simply scrolling down on your screen and typing into the comment box. Be sure to hit submit, of course, and it will show up on my screen, and I will share it with our guest and if you prefer to dial in uh, and ask the question on your own, um, you are very welcome to dial into our conference line, which is 323-476-3672 with the ID number 607-393-POUND. And if that went by a little too fast for you, not to worry, it will show up on your screen during the show. There we go, Dr. Woolman. Well, that's perfect. Uh, I'm glad we're on so I don't have to dial in. <laughs> <laughs> Seems uh, complicating for me. But uh, I'm very excited about talking with uh, Dr. Kathy Groover today. She has so many uh, things that uh, are important to us in what we do about body, mind, spirit connections, and healing that I want to, rather than continuing to introduce her, I want to get the show started and talk to her. So, Kathy, welcome to our show and welcome to our global audience. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. <laughs> it's really a lot of fun. Uh, what I usually do, Kathy, just to let you know, as the medical guide, I try to uh, give our viewers and listeners uh, a path that we're possibly going to take. So at the beginning, we're going to try and find out a little bit about you, your heart and soul, why you went into healing, how it all happened. And then we'll get into uh, some of the things you're doing in terms of the books you're writing, your television show. But then I want to spend some time also talking about your mind, body, and spirit work that you do and how you help uh, your clients and patients to heal. How's that sound to you? Sounds good to me. Excellent. So let's start out very simply with when did it all start for you? When did you get interested in healing? Uh, how did your course come about? And how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, it started out very uh, unexpectedly when I was a little kid. I would sit behind my dad on long car trips, and i rub his neck so he wouldn't get headaches because he did all the driving when we would travel during the summers. So little did I know that however many years ago that was, that started out my massage career. Um, I would sit in the, the basement. I was an only child. So I would sit in the basement in Pittsburgh and had to amuse myself somehow. So I would pull their medical textbooks off the shelf. And I was reading biology books and psychology books. And I was just fascinated with it all, even at such a young age. Um, when I was in high school, people would, would you know come to me and say, can you rub my shoulder? This, this part hurts and you're so good at it. And it was something that's, that always seemed to be a part of my life. Uh, but my main objective was theater. I was a theater major. I went to Point Park University in Pittsburgh. And it was during that time that I really discovered that I had a total passion for healing. Um, I had lost my mother um, when I was in high school. She died of cancer. I watched her going through chemo and radiation and multiple surgeries. She was addicted to morphine. She went through all these horrible side effects. And, and ultimately, it was the treatment that was her demise. And even then, I remember thinking, wow, is there something else for her? Is there something that maybe an herb or hypnosis or something could help? So I think that that helped plant the seed. Um, and then when I was in college, I met a woman who really opened my eyes to the fact that I was really good at massage and body work and I had a natural inclination to it. So I carried her teachings with me and I studied more massage in Los Angeles and here 
up here in Santa Barbara. And then that wasn't quite enough. So I got my master's and PhD and my doctor is a traditional naturopath. And it's now going to be a lifetime of learning for me because the more I know, the more I can help people um, who come around me to, to find things out. So I just, I'm totally addicted to the, to the learning aspect of what I do. I absolutely love it. Wow. You know, it's really interesting. And, and I have a feeling that Christina was thinking similarly to uh, what I was thinking. Uh, when I interviewed Christina a few weeks ago, uh, many of the same things that uh, you said were exactly uh, like what she brought up about the massage mm -hmm. and watching a parent uh, go through an illness and being interested in healing from a very young age. That's great. Thank you for sharing that uh, personal aspect with us. Of course. Uh, let's, let's get into uh, your authorship first. I want to talk about that, and I think that can lead us uh, eventually into the mind-body work that I, that I really want to know about how you do your work. So you've written a number of books now. You've written two books, The Alternative Medicine Cabinet and Body-Mind Therapies for the Body Worker. Tell us a little bit about the alternative medicine cabinet, because that led to some other things, I understand. Yeah, that grew out of um, the need and the desire to reach more people, uh, because, you know, as a massage, massage therapist, it's a pretty solitary practitioner, but, you know, practice. Um, I'm here with maybe one person at a time, sometimes two if we're doing a couple's massage and I have another therapist here, but I wanted to reach more people. So I started writing for local publications. I thought that would be a perfect way to uh, get the word out about different health options. And the more writing I did, the more I realized, wow, I want to reach even more people. And I had somebody say to me one day, oh, so you want to be a public speaker? And I said, yeah, you know, I have a theater background and, and that's what I'd like to be doing more of. And they said, oh, so then you have a book, right? And I went, yeah, sure. <laughs> I thought, oh, geez, I guess I need a book now. It's not enough that I'm doing all this other stuff. So I, I started to, I sat down, I started to write this very complicated, very technical book. And then I, this, this little boy, you know, this little tap on the shoulder and this voice said, uh, you've been doing all this writing and you have all these projects for school and you have all these things you've already researched. There's your book. So I put all of this stuff together in a collection, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons I called it the alternative medicine cabinet, because it is truly a, col a collection of multiple things I had written, multiple things I had explored. And I thought it was the perfect thing. You open it up and you pull out what you need at that time, which is how the title came about. Um, and that has, that's led to other things It actually just won the Beverly Hills book awards for the alternative medicine category. So, so excited about that. Congratulations. And yes, thanks. absolutely. I'm such a huge honor. I'm so, so thrilled to be able to say award-winning author. I, that just means the world to me. <laughs> Uh, and to everybody else, I mean, it, it, it does really, my sales have gone up since that happened. So that's very exciting. And then it did, it also led to the TV show, which is really exciting. Um, and then I finished my third book, literally just turned it into the publisher two days ago. The third book, is that on conquering stress? That is conquer your stress with mind body therapies. Mm. Um, body mind <laughs> therapies for the body worker came out in January. And mm. because my background is massage, and I learned so much about the mind-body connection from having my hands on my clients. I, I really wanted to give other massage therapists, body workers, other natural health practitioners a hint into how I learned about this and different options that I use for the mind-body techniques, uh, which I know we're going to get into in a little bit. So yeah, I'm, I'm soon to have three books. Very exciting. Oh, wow. And hopefully each one will be an award winner so that we can announce you next time as the multiple <laughs> I'm, running, I'm going to need two business cards put together to put all the stuff on my cards. <laughs> you could write a book on business cards. <laughs> yeah. That'd be your fourth <laughs> book. <laughs> well, that's pretty funny. Uh, let's okay. Let's let's get into this a little bit. Uh, you started massaging people, and you felt you could feel. When you're massaging someone, you've got anatomy under you, so everything is really concrete, and it's easy if you feel something is out of out of alignment, you can adjust it. Uh, but as you go into the mind body experience, how did that happen for you? Did you see people that were not getting totally better with the massage, and they needed one other or two other aspects, and that brought it out? 
Yeah, that is actually exactly the way it happened. Um, I had had my practice here in town probably for, geez, maybe eight or nine months. Uh, it was in this in my new office, so I knew it had to be pretty early on, probably in the first year. And I had a woman who was coming to me every week, and she was having not carpal tunnel per se, but carpal tunnel-ish symptoms. And she would get better. And then she'd go back to her life. And the following week, she'd come back to me just as bad as she was the week before. And I knew she was doing her homework. She was doing her stretching and her icing and taking the anti-inflammatories. And she adjusted her workstation. She was doing everything right, but just not getting past this final little part of healing. And so one day I was working on her. And I said, I was starting to get frustrated. I said, tell me again when this hurts you. And she said, well, it's, it's when I'm grabbing things, when I'm gripping stuff. I can't hold my hair dryer. Uh, I'm having trouble holding a glass of wine. And I thought, oh, my, that's awful. We have to fix you if you can't hold your glass of wine. <laughs> uh, but I started to listen to the words she said, grab and grasp and grip. And the thought came to me to ask her a question. So I said, well, is there something you're holding too tightly? Is there something that you need to let go? And she was quiet for just a brief second and then looked up at me and said, I don't want to let my kids go. And I was not only stunned that she had an answer, I was stunned that she had such a profound answer. And she then shared with me that when she was a kid, um, her brother had just gotten his driver's license at age 16, had gone out for a trip to somewhere and never came home. He was killed by a drunk driver. And it ripped her family apart. It devastated her parents, of course. And her kids were now at that age. They were 15 and 14. And they wanted freedom, and she was terrified to let them have it. Mm. And I suggested that she talk to her. I said, you know, have you ever shared this with your kids? And she said, no. And I said, you might want to tell them this story. They're at an age now where I think that would be important for them to know. And she went home that night, and she sat down after dinner and told them this story that she had never shared before. And they had a good cry, and they looked at old pictures. And the next time she came in, her hand pain was less. And then it was even less. And then it was two-week intervals for appointments. And then it was three-week intervals for appointments. And then it was her not having to come back. And I truly believe that it was that last bit of healing she needed. She still needed to adjust the workstation, to do the chiropractor, to see me, to take the anti-inflammatories. She still needed that. But the last step in her healing was that emotional component. So in no way am I saying we're causing our own illness. I've heard so many practitioners say that people are causing their own cancer. I would never say that. That's a completely inappropriate comment. But I think on some level, there's a contributing factor. And even if it's 10% and we can choose to make that difference, why would we not pick that to enhance our own healing? And I, I truly believe she would not have gotten past that last little bit had she not made that emotional connection. Yeah, that's that's a great connection there. Uh, so do you continue that with everyone now, or do you just start out with your massage, and if everybody gets better, you don't worry about a mind connection, you look for it, or what's your process when you uh, get someone to meet you for the first time and they're going to work with you? It, it really depends on the person. I mean, some people, they want to come in, they want to get an elbow in the knot, they want the trigger point to go away, they don't care about the underlying cause, They just want to feel better, which I totally understand that. You know, nobody comes to me and says, I want to learn about mind-body. I mean, why would you even think to ask that? Um, So there's certain people where if I feel they'd be open to it, I say, from a mind-body perspective, this corresponds with that. Or do, do you notice that stress exacerbates this problem? Or inevitably someone will come to me with neck pain and I kind of laugh a little bit and I say, well, who's the pain in your neck? And (laughs) no one has to think about that. Everybody knows the answer to that question. For some reason, it's typically the boss. Um, And, you know, not that you can go into your boss's office and say, hey, you're the pain in my neck. My massage therapist actually said I should quit my job because, you know, we can't (laughs) do that. But if you can uncover the reason, uh, sometimes just that acknowledgement of it, just that realization that there's a connection in there, you know, to that illness or dis-ease, as Louise Hay would say, can make all the difference. So I, I listen to how they talk about themselves, how they talk to themselves. Uh, you know, I had one woman come in my office. She burst in the door and she said, my neck has hurt me forever. Nobody can help. You're probably not going to be able to fix this. Should I take off my clothes? Wow. And I, <laughs> you can, but 
what am I supposed to do with that? You know, I mean, she had immediately <laughs> negated the appointment before she even got on a table. And that's a hard one. That's really hard really? to work with because no matter what I do, it's not going to work. It's not going to be enough. So it's interesting. I, I really do it on a case-by-case basis. Women are much more open to hearing about the mind-body connection than men. Um, I've had some who I just know I can't even bring it up. I've had some take a couple weeks and they'll come back a couple weeks later and they'll say, you know, I really thought about what you said to me and I think you might be right. I think stress might be making this worse. And to me, that is the biggest win. If someone actually thinks about what I propose and, and let it, you know, percolate in and see if it works for them and it does and they can make a change, that to me is, is just, it's fabulous. I love it. I would, uh, I would be remiss for our audience if we didn't find out what happened with the woman. That, uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we're all sitting here on pins and needles. Did Wonder she get undressed and did you help her? Um, she did get undressed. Uh, the massage was easier that way. And I worked with her. She only wanted to do a half hour. That's all she oh wanted to do. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, and she only wanted to come every two or three weeks. And I'm like, oh, just from a physical perspective, I need you so much more than that. Here's what changed. I can't say her pain decreased, but she learned things. Um, at this time, I was in my master's program, and we were actually using one of Louise Hayes' books as a text. And it was on the chapter where she was talking about waking up in the morning and looking in the mirror and saying, I love and accept myself just the way I am. And this woman was incredibly hard on herself. So I thought this could really help her. So I suggested that she start to do that. And she, her eyes popped open and she <laughs> very rebelliously said, well, that's just ridiculous. I can't do that. And I thought, <laughs> you can't do that. You can't look at yourself and say, I love you. And I realized, wow, that's sad um, that she used such strong language of I could never do that. And she said, I lived through the 60s. And she was an older woman. She said, I don't get this whole self-love hippie thing, and I just never understood this whole self-love thing. And I said, well, you swim every day, right? She said, yeah. I said, and you like to play bridge with your friends? And she said, yeah. And I said, and you like to travel with your husband? She said, yeah. And I said, and you come see me? She said, yeah. I said, you eat organic food, and you, you like to cook, and you, you like to put good things in your body? She said, yeah. And I said, that is self-love. And she was quiet for the longest time and then said, wow, you just taught an old lady a lesson. (laughs) So I don't know that her, you know, and I I convinced her to stop saying things like my stupid neck, my dumb neck, because that's not helping. Um, So when she was swimming, I would have her think my neck is strong. My neck is flexible. My neck is strong. You know, the affirmations part to me is huge. Uh, And we'll, we'll get into that. I know when we talk about the mind body connection, but, um, so I don't know. I know I helped her. I don't know to what degree, but even a little bit to me is, is, is well worth it. And then mm. she just sort of stopped coming. So I think I got a little too close. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you healed her and she's now happy with her mirror. Yeah. What the, uh, I what? love that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm suspecting that probably is what it, but I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know what happens with people when they leave her. Yeah. I can only hope. I can only hope that something is changing for the better. What is it? You brought this up uh, a few moments ago. What do you think the difference is? <laughs> this will be a simple question. What do you think the difference is between men and women? <laughs> <laughs> You're that, the doctor. Uh, I would think you should answer that. Um, uh, when a boy I'm, falls in love. We can no, ask okay. my son that. <laughs> yeah. How, yeah. At that so age. I'm, talk, um, I'm talking about I with think, the mind-body I, connection. Yes. I think because... Uh, you know, men are taught, and, and it's a societal thing too. We we acknowledge our bodies, but we really don't acknowledge our emotions. Those are scary, and those are ugly, and those make us cry, and those make us feel stuff. And you know, especially boys are you know, big boys don't cry, and you're not allowed to have emotions, and you're supposed to be you know, the big football player jock and not be sensitive. And I think that shift. I think that's really shifting in our society. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I don't even think it would occur to men to think about an emotion. I'll give you an example. I love this this example. Um, A gentleman came to me with neck pain. It was his boss. And um, (laughs) I knew his his work situation because I I knew him outside of my practice. And I said, well, you know, is there anything else going on you want me to address today? And he said, well, I just got diagnosed with an ulcer. 
And I said, oh, that sounds awful. I said, you know, I'm sure they gave you some pill for it. He goes, yeah, they gave me Prilosec. And I went, okay. I said, so what does this feel like to you? And he said, well, it, it bubbles up and it burns and then it you know, kind of bubbles up into my throat. Well, that to me sounded like repressed anger. So I said, well, is there something that's eating at you? Which is a phrase we've all, we've all heard. I said, you know, is there something that's eating at you? And he said, yeah, the doctor says I have too much acid. And I said, no, no, no. I understand the physiological aspect of it. I said, but is there something that's eating at you? And he said, well, spicy food. And I said, no, 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 no. And I thought if I said it one more time, a little more dramatic with gestures. So I went, no, is there something eating at you? And he went, oh, oh, I'm so stupid. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tomatoes, onions, garlic. (laughs) He wasn't going to get it. Now, I could have said to him, do you think this could be repressed anger because you resent your boss and you won't stand up to him, but you can't express it to him, so your body is translating that into a physical disease? And he still probably would have listed off onions, tomatoes, garlic, pepper. (laughs) He wasn't ready to make that leap. Where I've said things like that to other people, like the woman who I said, you know, is there something you're gripping too tightly? She immediately had an answer. It made total sense to her. Now, I, I certainly could have walked him through that possibility, but to me, it's not as effective if they don't come to that themselves. And more men come here and they want to fall asleep and have an elbow in their glute and the pain to go away than to talk about feelings. Um, I try to introduce it where I can, uh, but typically it comes up more with women. Hmm. Hmm. So, so do you find that, um, you, you said that there's a shift in society. Um, do you find that the men that are actually coming in for the massage therapy, that these individuals, because they've actually taken a step into that, the world of, of healing arts, that they are more open to being more emotionally connected, et cetera? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, there, For the longest time also was a, st- a stigma of men coming for a massage. And I have so many wives who I work on where they say, oh, my husband doesn't want anybody touching them. Mm-hmm. They either think they're too fat, they think they're too hairy, they're afraid they're going to get an erection, they're afraid they're going to be embarrassed. Um, none of those are good reasons to not come for body work. You know, athletes, you know, NFL, NBA, I mean, they're getting massaged all the time. It's not an emasculating thing. Um, so I think the ones that have stepped into that um, are a little more open to talking about it. And I have seen, just the way my practice has shifted, I have seen more people probably in the last four or five years more open to talking about that than the first five years. Mm-hmm. And that could be me. I could just be more sensitive to who I'm attracting to my practice and who um is more open to hearing about it. You know, maybe I'm just giving off something different. It's, it's hard to say what the shift has been. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I, I also see it a lot in, in schools too, though, because of the, the kids growing up. They're allowed to cry now. Oh, good. <laughs> Little yeah, boys. I, mean, I don't want them to cry, but, you know, yeah, good. yeah. making shifts. Uh, I, I hope so. I hope so. Um, do, you get, do you get a lot of young people in your practice as well? Because I, I notice that a lot of parents are beginning to send their teens, you know, because of the testing, the things like that, that they're getting a lot of stress. The kids are getting a lot of stress these days. Do you see a lot of that come through? The the more kids that I've had have been maybe 13 to 19 who are doing sports. Mm. So usually that would be, you know, my daughter's playing basketball and she's having calf issues or my son's heading off to play baseball and his shoulders messed up. So I get that more from the, the, from the physical perspective. Mm -hmm. What's interesting though, is I have a really great affinity for, I'm going to call them kids. They're not really kids, but from 19 to 27, Mm -hmm. for some reason, I have a really great connection with that age, which is kind of funny because when I was that age, I could not connect to people my own age. So now that I'm twice that age, I, I have, I don't know, a, uh, a connection with them. And I think they appreciate my wisdom, but I'm still young enough to be cool and relate to them on a, on a social level. Mm-hmm. So it's been, it's been interesting to have kids like that in my practice. And I have a lot of kids who are, again, I'm saying kids, they're in their early twenties struggling with either previous addiction or anxiety issues. Maybe they're smoking a lot of pot to cope with things that they're dealing with. So I actually see a lot of that going through and I've been Mm. able to use some of these mind body techniques to hopefully help them cope with the things that they're dealing with that they're, that they find scary. Um, I was very surprised the other day. I mean, after, after Boston happened, of course it shook up a whole heck of a lot of people, but I was really surprised to hear this, you know, very athletic, very masculine, 24 year old, 
boy, man, um, express his very raw fear about, boy, it gets to the point where you don't even want to leave the house anymore. It gets really scary. You never know if you're going to come back alive. Mm. And I found it so interesting that at a, a, a male at that age who's into sports and into competitive and into express that to me. I actually, I mean, I, I was sorry he felt that way, but I thought it was really just an amazing piece of evolution that he was able to come to terms with feelings like that and share those with me during a massage. I was, I was really impressed with that. Mm. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Especially at 24. They're usually out partying. <laughs> yeah, not yeah. this kid. He is not interested in that at all. It's real, And I've seen a lot of that age who they don't want to go out and get drunk. That doesn't interest them. So it's, it's interesting what's happening. It's really fascinating to watch it all unfold before my eyes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, that's very exciting that they are willing to connect with the body-mind. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's more, that for me, that's really exciting to hear. You know, yeah, at that definitely. Age. Well, and the adults too. But I think the earlier we can start, and the program I did at Harvard the, at the uh, Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine, one of the specific programs they have is to train you to do this with youth. And they, they have started having satellite programs all over the country, more on the East Coast, uh, but going into schools and helping kids deal with this sort of thing. Because there's stresses today that you know teens have that I, didn't ha I wasn't faced with. I mean, I felt mm -hmm. bad enough that I wasn't invited to the cool party, but I didn't have to look at hundreds of pictures of it on Facebook the next day. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, yes. It's really something that you never thought. And you're friends with people, and then you're unfriended, and who's in a relationship? And I'm, you know, it's, it's really... There's no, shh, don't tell Kathy there's a party. She'll never know. Well, there's no way to not know anymore. And that's got to be so hurtful for so many kids. Mm. Um, I almost, I don't have children, but I would almost think I wouldn't want them on Facebook just to shield them from that emotional drama. I think it's got to be really tough to be a kid that age. And mm -hmm. I don't envy it. I would not go back to high school right now. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. How about yeah. you, Glenn? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Uh, no, I wouldn't go back, uh, although I would probably love going back to medical school again because I think, uh, like Kathy, I, I love learning. And the things that we learned in medical school, you know, when you, when you get a, a book in, uh, in your medical classes, when you buy a book on histology or anatomy, well, not necessarily anatomy, but many other aspects of medicine and science, that book, by the time it comes out, it was already five years old in terms of mm. in terms of knowledge so the knowledge that's out there today uh, is so much more we know so much more and we see that in our advances and in, in uh, the types of chemotherapy that we're able to give people and medications and and diagnostic uh, imaging studies and laboratory tests there's so much more so I might consider that but probably not I like where I am right now I must say that uh, when I was in the emergency department I saw uh, so many things that on, not even on an emotional level, but more of an intellectual level, I knew that every day that I went out, I might not come back because I saw it happening so often in our society with so many people. But I digress. I want to talk about mind, mind, spirit, body connections. When you first uh, started your studies, Kathy, you uh, were a licensed massage therapist. Did they teach you anything about mind and body connections in your training? Not a thing. Um, and it's actually funny now because, you know, I wrote this book specifically for therapists and I approached several massage schools and said, hey, would you be interested in adding this to, to your curriculum? And so many of them said, oh, we have a mind-body program already, which mm. I was so excited to hear. Bummed they're not using my book. Um, but I was very mm. excited to hear that they're, they're covering that aspect of it. I don't think you can be around people all the time putting your hands on them and not experiencing some of the other stuff. I mean, I know it's out there. I, I definitely take my practice further than most therapists. In fact, I was working with a massage therapist. She came in for uh, a Reiki treatment and halfway through the Reiki treatment, she burst into tears. Well, I'm used to that. That doesn't bother me. If you're getting those emotions out, I think that's fabulous. And then she said to me, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I hate when my clients cry. I don't know what to do with them. I just want to massage them and send them on their way. And I mm. thought, 
what? <laughs> I mean, like, how can you dismiss that aspect of the healing? But she was purely physical practitioner. That's all she wanted to do. She didn't want to hear about the divorce, the dead dog, or the problems. She wanted to rub them and send them on their way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think I, and I don't know, you know, tons of massage therapists around the country, but I would venture to say I'm probably in the minority of how most massage therapists practice. Mm-hmm. I agree. When you're when you are, yeah, I agree too. When you're practicing and and you put your hands on someone, you're you're also coming from your naturopathic mind and you're coming from your Reiki mind. Uh, what's going on on your fingers when you're uh, working on somebody? Or you're not just feeling the muscles and anatomy. What else is going on with you? Yeah, because I do a lot of trigger point work and trigger points, you can usually feel a change in the tissue under your fingers. So it almost feels like cooked pasta. I mean, it has a really specific feel to it. I have incredibly sensitive fingers to changes. So I can see someone on a Tuesday and then three weeks later, see them again and say, oh, this feels different than it did last time. I could actually, I have that sense memory that I can remember that. So I'm not only feeling for temperature and texture changes, I want to know how the muscle is feeling. I want to know how the skin feels. I have sent people to dermatologists because I go, oh, that doesn't look right. Um, I'm really good at thyroid issues. So I can look at people and suspect, I'm not a diagnose, I'm not a doctor, but I can suspect something and send them to my favorite endocrinologist. So I'm really looking at the whole person. I want to know in all aspects of health what's going on. Uh, to me, that's my job. Um, and again, I think that's very different than most massage therapists just because they haven't trained the way I have. And it's so funny, Glenn, you talk about, um, you know, the textbooks and everything. I read medical textbooks for fun. So I have all these friends that want to connect on Goodreads and they want to know what I'm reading now. And I'm like, yeah, you actually don't know what I'm, you don't want to know. <laughs> I'm reading a 700 page book on endocrinology, uh, endocrinology emergencies. I don't think you want to, I don't, you're not going to, we're not going to have a book club about that. Uh, we could start a medical book club. That'd be so fun. We could all talk about diseases. I, I'm just obsessed with it. I would watch house and take notes uh, because I just, I absorb medical stuff. And I had so many people say, why didn't you go to medical school? It didn't even occur to me. I was a theater major period. It, and I was terrible in math, which probably would have held me back, but it never occurred to me. And even now I don't, I think I'd make a great doctor. I think I'd make a horrible medical student. Um, (laughs) so I'll just, I'll do my continuing ed and I'll, I'll read my medical books for fun. Uh, and, but I do, I believe my job is to look at all aspects of their health. And if they're having something that I know I can't deal with, I will send them to a professional who can. Oftentimes it's a chiropractor. I, I work very closely with some chiropractors in town, but that's, that's my job is to facilitate their healing, whatever form that takes. I would be remiss again for our audience if I didn't talk about the uh, cooked pasta. Is that al dente or is it fully cooked? <laughs> it's probably a little more al dente. <laughs> okay. No, it's, it just it just has a different feeling to it. Um, and I have the same ability with my elbows. So if I'm working on oh. someone, cause I do a lot of elbow work because I do deep tissue. I mean, sure. I'll hit someone's piriformis and they'll go, how did you know that hurt? I don't know. I just, I think part of his instinct, um, I played a game with one client where he said, okay, you have one shot. You get to touch one spot on my back. Tell me where it hurts. And I went, pink. And I went right to it. I just, I could tell, I just knew. So I think part of it is instinct. I think part of it is, you know, when you've had your hands on so many bodies, there's subtle things you recognize. There's patterns that you've seen previously and your mind has the ability, your brain has the ability to return to that pattern, um, and identify it again. So I don't think I'm particularly special. I think I've just honed my skills. Very nice. When you go back to, uh, the Benson Institute, uh, Mm -hmm. Herbert Benson, and you're learning about mind body, what's, what's new in mind body that, uh, we should know about that you came back from your last, uh, conference? The most exciting thing that I learned at this conference, and I did my first one, I guess it would have been 2011. Um, The most exciting thing for me was to find that I was sitting in a room with about 120 MDs. Now, I'm not an MD, um, so I was probably one of the younger people there. I was one of the least medically trained people. Um, But there was such a respect for what I did. And so many of them, if we were talking about something that was a little bit alternative or more in the natural health realm, they would turn to me and say, what do you think about that? Or I didn't understand what she said. Is this something you do? Can you explain it? So that was thrilling to me. Um, 
The other thing that was exciting is so many of these MDs said at the end of the week that they were going back to their practice to make changes. They were going to incorporate the things we learned into their hospital, into their clinic, into their practice. That thrilled me thrilled me. And we looked at, you know, things like functional magnetic resonance imaging, and we looked at what the changes were in the brain of people who are meditating. Uh, I'm so excited that this stuff is going more mainstream and that some large hospitals and schools like Harvard are investigating what the mind-body connection is actually structurally, physically doing to us. That is thrilling me because no longer is it relegated to, oh, there's some weird chick down the street in the back room that does this stuff. It's, it's becoming mainstream. And I think this is the next phase of medicine. I think we have to look at the mind and our words, thoughts, uh, expectations and how that affects us. And I think we're moving that direction. I think we're going to see some really phenomenal research coming out in the next couple of years about things like placebo. I mean, we already are. Um, placebo sure. effect and the way it's actually helping people heal is fascinating. And some of the studies they've done using open versus closed treatments and placebo and fake surgeries, and it's really stunning what the body can do when the mind tells it to. It's mm. It's I was going to say mind blowing, no pun intended, but yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's really incredible stuff. Yeah. It's interesting for me. I was uh, watching some uh, videos on some of these open and closed placebo surgeries. And there's a part of me that I felt uncomfortable about that. Having somebody uh, open up a knee, do nothing, for example, and close it and get it. I'm happy that they get a good result, but uh, it's hard for me to uh, get behind. This is something that maybe I have to work on in my own mind-body experience. But I felt uncomfortable knowing that we would put someone under anesthesia, open them up just so they could have sutures. and and But they did get better. And so I'm very happy about that part. And maybe in the future, with more of this knowledge, we won't have to do that. Uh, but it's just something that's uh, still of concern to me. When I look at the functional magnetic resonance imaging and seeing uh, when we test somebody and they're meditating and we see what part of the brain lights up or we test someone with anger or some other emotion and we see different parts of the brain that light up, did you get any sense uh, back uh, in Boston that these parts of the brain that were lighting up, it seemed like... It was hard for me to understand whether it was cause or effect. Was was that part of the brain able to generate the emotion, or was it the area where the emotion uh, got uh, manipulated? Yeah, that was unclear to me as well. And because, again, I'm not a medical doctor, so they're showing me all these images, and I'm thinking, that's pretty. Um, but I don't, <laughs> I, I'm not that familiar right. with the brain. So a lot of that stuff, that was the one section where it was just, just a little too over my head. Um, but I wanted to go back to what you said about the placebo and the, the knee surgeries, and they did it with heart surgery too. Um, I agree with you. And there's um, a uh, doctor and an educator out of the University of Turin in Italy named Fabrizio Benedetti, who actually endorsed my latest book, who I'm very, I just, he's a rock star to me. He was the one that really started exploring the open versus closed treatment um, and looking at maybe active medicine, placebo, no treatment, because how do you test for the placebo when what you're testing is the placebo? I, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it was this, this hard thing for him to figure out, but what was really neat is he would do, and I don't know if you, if you read the study, he would look at the effect of pain meds. So he would go to someone who was in the hospital and he'd have the syringe of morphine. He'd say, okay, well, what's your pain level now? It's a 10. Okay, well, we're going to give you this morphine. You let me know when you start to feel better. And in clear view of the patient, he would inject it into the IV. They'd wait a little bit. And then the patient would say, oh, that is better. Now I'm at a three. Okay. They gave them saline mm -hmm. and the pain would still go down. But in contrary to that, they would randomly give pain meds through a machine that was completely hidden. So that the patient didn't know when it was being administered. The pain wouldn't drop as much if they kept a pain chart throughout the course of the day. And what they found in looking at the brain was just that anticipation of getting those meds before it was ever even injected, the opiate receptors in the brain lit up. So just right. the anticipation of getting that pain med and then getting a saline, which clearly isn't going to take our pain away, that to me is phenomenal. And that's just such an illustration of what the placebo could do. How many people, even if we don't give them saline, but if we use less pain meds um, or... 
you know, it'll be lower hospital stays, you know, pain meds inevitably cause in some people nausea and vomiting, constipation and, you know, uh, and addiction issues. And if we can find a way to incorporate this into mainstream medical practice, how many benefits will we get from that? I, I think it's just, uh, it just holds a really interesting future for, for medicine and pain, pain reduction. There's a lot of great things. Uh, that's one of the great parts about being a healer and being in medicine, that it's always a frontier. You know, some of the things that we're finding new are things that we used thousands of years ago, but there are also many things that we're finding new that we haven't really used before. I wanted to go back to uh, a statement that you made just out of curiosity. When you were with the doctors at the conference and there were some things that they didn't understand that they asked you to explain to them, can you give us one example of something that they didn't understand? Yeah, interestingly, one of the big things was the nutrition. Uh, because, you know, I know in medical school, you maybe have what an option to do one or two nutrition classes, but it's not required. I think schools are changing that. So when we had a section on nutrition, and frankly, I have to say it was the one section of the whole conference. I felt the speaker was completely lacking. She was um, a registered dietitian, and they have a very different view on nutrition than I do. Uh, and she was talking about, you know, increasing your grains, which right now we know wheat is a big issue for a lot of people. And she was talking about the benefits of alternative sweeteners. And I'm just sitting there in the front row cringing that she's saying these things. So I raised my hand, and I was driving her crazy because my hand was constantly shooting up. Hey, <laughs> What about blood? You know, she's like, oh, what? You know, I can see she was tired of tired of talking to me. But I raised enough questions, and then interestingly, I raised questions she couldn't answer. Um, so afterwards, you know, we had our break at that point where we went straight to food, which was all cheese and bread. Which I thought, can we have some protein? We're just talking about nutrition. Um, so I meditated on it. And I felt better. Um, but a lot of them came up to me and said, hey, hey, you were talking about artificial sweetener. I wondered about that. Or, you know, what, do you, what have you learned about the gluten sensitivity? And a lot of people came up to me and talked about that. Um, I had also done Tai Chi before. And because of my massage background, people were asking me about things like Reiki um, that we didn't cover during the, the conference. But um, I don't know if I had asked a question about it or something or, or they knew I did Reiki. But so we had really a, a lot of really fabulous open conversations about different options. And I have to say, I was really terrified to go. Um, and when I found out about the conference, it was because I was searching for mind-body info for my dissertation. And when Harvard popped up with this class, I went running into the other room and I said to my husband, there's this mind-body class at Harvard and I really want to go. And he said, so go. And I said, but it's Harvard. And he said, so? And I said, but it's for doctors. And he said, so? And I said, but it's Harvard. <laughs> he said, what is wrong with you? He said, when have you ever been afraid of doctors? When have you ever been embarrassed that you think you don't know enough? If you want to go to Harvard, go. And so I signed up that afternoon. Um, but it was a little scary. I didn't know how I'd fit into that, you know, that population. Um, but I found it so welcoming and so open, which was also exciting to me, uh, that I'm really seeing a shift in, in how Western medicine is viewing things like this. It was very exciting. Um, so Kathy, you have a, you have your PhD in natural health, natural, oh, natural health. So it's not, uh, not uh, naturopathy Na is na nat naturopathy. Naturopathy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, or some people say nat nat well, naturopathy, naturopath. Yeah. Um, I have my my first degree was as a traditional naturopath. Now in California, we have to make that distinction because there's uh, a handful of schools who are four year brick and mortar schools who give you an ND degree, and that makes you. It's more medical than what I did. I did traditional stuff. So I was learning about air and food and water and mind-body medicine and acupuncture and homeopathics and herbs, things that are much less invasive. And the four-year brick-and-mortar schools found it very offensive that I was getting out of the kind of program I did with the same letters behind my name that they had. So a bunch of laws were passed. There was a bunch of hoopla ensued. And I am no longer allowed to say doctor and I'm no longer allowed to say N.D., in Ooh, California. In California. In, others, in other states, I can. Some states, it's it's crazy. And then, of course, the MDs, the medical doctors, got up in arms about these other MDs that 
thought they were doing medicine. And I thought, can we all just get along? Um, can we all just, we all want people to heal. I don't, I'm, I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be the town physician. I mean, actually it would be fun, but I'm, that's not my objective. I'm not trying to take patients away from anybody. Um, and I think if we could all combine our efforts and use the strengths that we have, um, I love working in concert with Western medicine. I, I love their diagnostics. I love uh, you know, so much about it. I think we're overusing many aspects of it. And I know doctors are frustrated with that as well. But I think if we could all find a way to work together with the skills that we have, we would have so many more healthy people and not be dealing with disease management and not true healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in your experience, because of your background and because you yeah, this is what I find so strange. It's like here you have the dietitian, and then here you have the nutritionalist. You know, right. <laughs> and it's like, uh, aren't you both the same of the same? <laughs> but the the philosophies behind the two are very different, aren't they? They really are. And um, the registered dietitian, from what I understand, um, and this has not been, I'm not you know, proving this in any way. But what I understand is a lot of the, and the, uh, dietitian programs are funded by big food. So mm. they're, you know, it's very main quote mainstream medical, which, which is heavily funded by pharmaceutical companies and food companies. So if your program is being funded by artificial sweetener companies and packaged food companies, they're not going to teach you that that stuff is bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not funded by anybody. <laughs> I have no interest in take, you know, I'm not getting government money. I'm not getting any of that stuff. You know, so I read as much as I can and I distill that down and I try to come forward with the most honest opinion that I can. Um, Without trying to offend anybody, I've already had um, nasty emails from the Corn Refiners Association um, <laughs> saying, how dare I say don't eat high fructose corn syrup? And I thought, wow, I must have become really important if they think I'm important enough that they should, you know, write me a couple letters. So, yeah. So I, I do my best to read everything I can and distill the information down and present it as honestly as I can. Do I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure there have been things I've been, you know, not 100% accurate on, but I do really do my best to make sure I'm giving good information to everyone. Fabulous. Mm. Did you uh, did you get the letter after you got your award or before your award? It was when my book first came out, so it was barely read by anybody, and they wow. were on me very quickly. Of let's talk about this, Doctor Groover. We know you're very busy, but here's the studies we've done showing high fructose corn syrup is totally safe, and I didn't even respond. <laughs> I I can't go there. Nope, That's, nope, can't do it. Can't yes. do it. One of our resident uh, guest. Uh, speakers here on uh, Magical Medical Tour, Tracy Harrison. Uh, she's a nutritionist, but she's also very different. Uh, she was on with us uh, a few weeks ago, and she has uh, agreed to be on with us a few more times. In fact, I believe we're going to be on with her next week. And she has some very good views on nutrition versus the uh, licensed dietitians and a number of other things. And I find uh, her way of looking at it is fascinating. I also found that uh, when I used to go to conferences in emergency medicine, all these conferences, when you'd go out on the breaks, the foods that they had were always donuts and, and candies and fruits <laughs> and things like that. And now I must say that they are changing. They, they are putting some healthier things out there uh, for us to snack on as we go out on our breaks. So that's a good sign. I really like that. Uh, Getting back to the mind-body again, and I want to stay on this for a while uh, until we end, practically. Uh, <clears throat> do you see differences in yourself as you're working on someone? Do you make different mind-body connections when you're working on someone, and are they related? I know in Reiki, for example, you're supposed to be just a vessel that, that things go through or that energies go through, but do you get... Uh, caught up in the part of the mind-body experience as you're working on someone's own issues? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to say not so much. Um, if anything, the mind-body uh, 
tools that I've learned, I've incorporated into my private life. Um, but when I'm working with clients, I often use personal examples if I want to give them an example of something. So if I'm work, sitting down and working with them through cognitive restructuring to get them to understand the chart and the distortions and the distorted thinking, I'm going to use an example from my own life to show them how to lay it all out. I think that does one of two things. I think it gives them a good usable example, but I think it also lets them know, look, I've been through this too, and I have stressors, and I have times that I still fail at, at controlling my stress response. Uh, so in that way, I think I get engaged with that. Um, but on a daily basis, I mean, I still do my many meditations. Oftentimes I will do that during a massage because they're being quiet. I'm being quiet. It's a time that I can be go inward as well as I'm working on them. Um, but I don't know that as I'm working on people, it really changes my attitude towards it very much. I think I'm just either in that state or I'm not depending on who's around. <laughs> Talk to us about some of the tools that you just mentioned. Yes. Um, the, the mini meditations, this to me is the most fabulous thing. And, um, when I was at Harvard, I, I like to sit in the front row. I wanted to be close to the action. And yeah, you're one of those. I'm one of those. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I am. Um, I like to get picked on apparently. Uh, so she said, you know, today we're going to meditate. And I thought, oh boy, because I'm terrible at it. I just am. I, I talk fast. I walk fast. I think fast. <laughs> so I, you know, I dance five days a week. That's my meditation. So don't tell me to sit on a pillow and quiet my mind and still my body. I'm terrible at it. I'm very type A. So when she said today, we're going to meditate. I thought, oh, great. This is a wasted day. Um, <laughs> she said, okay, here are the, oh, she said, does, does, does anybody think they can't meditate? And she looked straight at me when she said that as if I had like type A tattooed on my forehead or something and I raised <laughs> my hand. Um, so we learned this type of meditation. Um, there's only two rules. The first rule is uh, to concentrate on something repetitive. And we did that by concentrating on our breath. And then the second rule is if thoughts float through, which inevitably they do, uh, you just dismiss them without judgment. And I'm sitting there waiting to write down the rest of the rules, you know, crossing your legs and putting your tongue and looking up and, you know, the finger position. And there was none of that. So um, we concentrate on our breath, the in and out. Um, it's perfect just the way it is. You're not trying to change it. It's just you're using that as a focal point. And then on your inhale, you think, I am. And on your exhale, you think, at peace. So you're inhaling, I am exhaling at peace. And if thoughts float through, you just dismiss them without judgment. And what this does is it quiets the mind and it stops that stress response because stress is not our problem. And stress isn't the problem because we can't control it. We can't control what's happening in the government. We can't control the fiscal cliff. We can't control the unemployment. We can't control the traffic. We can't control the woman in line in front of us at the post office that has to look at every stamp ever made before she picks the flowers. We can't control those things. And it's those things that cause us stress. And she's been in front of all of us, I know. Um, but what we can control is our reaction to that. And to me, the mini meditations and using affirmations are two of my favorite go-to tools that are simple. You can do them yourself. You don't need to be led through them. So just on the inhale, I am, and the exhale, at peace. And it stops that stress response. You can now deal with the traffic and the post office and things easier. It doesn't make the stress go away. It makes it more handleable. And that is the best we can do. Um, cognitive restructuring, a lot of psychologists work with that. It's an issue of looking at one of your common stressors, seeing where you have distorted thinking about that, and then finding actionable items you can do to, again, change your stress response. Um, I had a client who was very upset, um, and her fear was that she was going to die and leave her son untaken care of. Well, that's, I think as a parent, that's a, a logical fear. And, you know, I, a lot of people have a fear of death. We are all going to die. Um, and I asked her if she had a will and she said, well, no, well, doesn't that quickly solve the problem? Because she still might have a fear that she's going to die, but the fear that the son will not be taken care of has been erased. So in sitting down and looking at some of her thinking about this issue, we came to the conclusion that she should talk to an attorney and get things put in place, talk to her family about if something would happen to him what they would do, how they would handle it. And her stress about that situation went away. It's still going to happen at some point, but it's not, she doesn't stress about it because now her son's taken care of. So and that's what cognitive restructuring does is, is really look at practical things you can do to help decrease that response. Um, and then affirmations is my favorite. It's estimated that we have about 60,000 thoughts a day and that 50,000 of those are negative. 
it's a huge amount of negative thoughts. Um, and to me, those negative thoughts mean negative results. So rather than trying to stop those thoughts, because I'm as bad at stopping thoughts as I am at meditating, we can change them. So rather than saying something like, I'm not getting sick, I'm not getting sick, I'm not getting sick, which I hear people say all the time, or I know it, I'm getting sick, or I'm not sick yet, or you know whatever it is, change that to, I am healthy and well, my immune system is strong and resilient. And the studies that I've read show that actually boosts the immune system. And we can activate the white blood cells by changing our language. And it changes outcomes. So affirmations and the mini meditations are definitely two things I recommend that, that we can put in practice today. It seems like uh, those are great tips. And I'm going to ask you now, as we speak with Dr. Kathy Groover, who is an author, uh, educator, uh, has her own television show and is a licensed uh, massage therapist who does body mind work. We're going to ask you for a health tip, but it seems like you just gave us some. I hope you have another one for us. I do. My health tip does encompass the whole thing of body, mind, and spirit. We have to put good things in, and we have to put good food in, we have to put good thoughts in, and we have to put a good spirit in. And to me, that is the trifecta of health, is making sure that we are encompassing all of those things of body, mind, spirit. And we talk so much about you know exercising and organic and low BMI. We rarely talk about what we're putting into our minds, um, both from external and internal sources. And to me, I think that's the missing key to health. Even if it's 10%, if we can make that difference for a 10% return, I think we need to. So put in good stuff. That's, that's the tip. That's a great tip. Uh, I like the way you say that too. Kathy, uh, we've been speaking for almost an hour now, and we've covered a, a number of topics. Is there anything that when you prepared for this show you wanted to talk about that we haven't t spoken about yet? No, I think we covered it. To me, the mini meditations is the best thing you can walk away with. I mean, it truly has, it's changed me. I am much more pleasant to drive with now that I do mini meditations and don't just yell at people around me. Um, and I've, I've found it helped a lot of, you know, I was talking about these 20 year olds who uh, were either newly out of an addiction program or who are still smoking enormous amounts of, of, marijuana to cope. And I had one kid, this was so satisfying. He said, Oh, I got really angry the other day. And I said, really, I'm so sorry. And he goes, yeah, I wanted to go smoke a bowl. And I said, okay. And he goes, but I did that mini crap, that mini thing you taught me. <laughs> it kind of helped. And I thought he called it the mini crap. That's fine. But he then followed that up with, it kind of helped. And that was a big win for me. You know, if this kind of rebellious pot smoking surfer, 22 year old or however, however old he is, found it useful a little bit, That's that was a good thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> Christine, any thoughts? That was a great I story, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but what a gift for him. Yeah. He just doesn't know it yet. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Any thoughts, Christina? Oh, I, I, I you know, Glenn uh, and Kathy, it's uh, this whole body, mind, spirit balance. I mean, that is, that is, Yoga Hub. That was the vision of Yoga Hub. So everything that you spoke of today, Kathy, fits right into, you know, um, what I had envisioned for this whole global site that we have. And it's also the the essence of my Wednesday show, which is the tetrahedron of body, mind, spirit is uh, the triangle of life and to keep the two of those balanced. So everything you've said today has just been such a joy to sit quietly and listen and just take it all in and go, yeah, <laughs> she's our kind of woman right there. <laughs> yeah, great stories. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. I'm grateful to our special guest, Dr. Kathy Groover for sharing her wisdom and expertise on her journey. And I, I'm also grateful and would like to thank all of my healers and educators and teachers uh, for allowing me to be on my journey. I look forward to being with you, Christina, again next week in our global audience as we search another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy on Magical Medical Tour, looking for optimal health. Mm -hmm. So until that time, I say goodbye and thank you very much, Kathy. We really appreciate all of the things you talked about today. Great, great advice and great tips. And I wish everyone optimal health. 
Yes, and thank you again, Dr. Kathy Groover. And, you know, I would love for you to just take a moment and hold up your two books or three oh, books. Yeah. <laughs> well, the three is not ready. Okay, so we've uh, got Alternative Medicine Cabinet. There you no, go. Uh, get the light right there. Mm-hmm. Yep, notice we the got new it. winner sticker. Yay! Yay. Uh, and, Yay. Then, <laughs> and then the second book is, where's the, there we go, Body Mind Therapies for the Body Worker. I Fabulous. love that cover. That is so much mm, fun. Uh, and then the third book will be out, um, like I said, just arrived at the publisher, so it should be out June or July of 2013. So very excited about that. And you can find all that stuff on my site. Wonderful. We look forward to... Ah, going through all of them. Now you have to turn them into audiobooks for the people like us. <laughs> hey, they're ebooks already, so you can grab them on Kindle. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And of course, we'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us on this new platform of education and information. We're grateful for your continuous support and look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. We invite you to join us live on Tuesdays for Magical Medical Tour at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Time, 1.30 Eastern Time, Wednesdays for Trinity of Life at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, followed every other week with Flowing into Awareness with Anatara. And I'd like to remind you that you can also contact Dr. Glenn Woolman at myyogahub.com forward slash gwoolman. Follow him on Twitter at Glenn Woolman and, of course, through his own site glennwoolman.com, where I do encourage you to learn about his metaphor square breath. That's his mini meditation. (laughs) Until we meet again, namaste. between all three and you know the strong balance between all three that uh, it's it's so interesting to hear you say that one person's chosen to do you know the traditional form of medicine and going to church every day or doing something you know that that just rebalances that part of that trinity within them right absolutely but i love the gardening though (laughs) yeah 